So today we will discuss linear spaces and Grassmannians. And of course, if there are any questions at any point, just please uh, ask me. Maybe you recall from uh, the second lecture, we constructed a projective space. For this, we needed a vector space. Let's say of dimension n. over some field. <coughs> and our basic algebraic projective variety was the projective space itself that parameterized, that is the points of the projective space, they corresponded to lines in the vector space V. And for example, when we worked over complex numbers, this was the principal example of a compact algebraic variety. The aim of today's lecture is to generalize this construction so that the variety that we construct will not parameterize lines, that is one-dimensional vector subspaces of V, but k-dimensional vector subspaces. So we have to fix an integer, uh, at most uh, big N, and we want to construct a Grassmannian that either I will write GKV or I will write GKN that parameterizes, so for a point, P in the Grassmannian. We want P to correspond with a subspace, linear subspace of V of dimension K. Okay? So we, we want to construct such an object. And how do we do that? Well, before, before we make a formal definition, Let's think what we can associate to a vector subspace W. And I want to make the first construction very explicit in the coordinates. So I fix a basis, E1 up to En basis of V. And if I fix W, then I can also fix some basis of W. This is not canonical, but I can choose a basis of W, yes? So these are K vectors of length N when I fix the basis of, uh, of V. Uh, now I can represent these vectors in a form of a matrix. It's a K by N matrix, F1 up to FK. This representation is of course not unique because when I will be changing the basis of W, the, the vectors will change and the matrix will change. Yes, that's, that's clear. But at least if I am given a matrix, of full rank, that is of rank K, I can reconstruct W. Yes, that's the span of the rows of the matrix. Okay, so let's, let's start building the diagram that will help us to construct the Grassmannians. We have K by N, by N matrices. of rank K. MW. And to such a matrix, I can associate a subspace. Yes, but remember, 
our aim is to construct preferably a projective variety with points corresponding to these subspaces. So our aim is not to build the map this way, but somehow to build a map from those subspaces, an injective map, to some projective space of, so far we don't know which dimension, M. So this is what we want. Okay, but in particular, if we expect such a map to exist, we also need a map that will associate to matrix a point, yes? And this map has to not depend on linear combinations of uh, rows in the matrix MW. Let me, let me say it, let me say it a little bit using the group structure. So remember that GLK, this is the group of invertible K by K matrices, general linear group, and it acts on K by N matrices by multiplication. And what I'm saying is, is something very trivial. It just replaces the rows of matrix MW by their linear combinations coming from GLK. Yes, any questions about this? If I, if I take an element here, let's say A, then if I take A times MW, then this changes the basis of W, but it doesn't change the space W. In other words, whatever this map here is, it needs to be invariant with respect to this action. So whatever functions we define here, they need to forget when, they, they need to not see the fact that I changed the rows of the matrix MW. So now comes a question for you. We, we are given a matrix, K by N matrix MW, and we want to construct as many functions as possible to get a map into the projective space, but such functions that will not change, or at least up to scalar will not change, under arbitrary linear row operations. So can anyone give me an example of such a function? Yeah, I'm given a K by N matrix, and I want a polynomial that will not change, for example, if I replace the first row by the sum of first two rows. Any function. So for example, if I would take the first left entry, that would change. That's not a good function. But maybe, maybe someone knows functions that don't change, or at least don't change up to scalar, when, yes? The determinant would be one of them. The determinant, the determinant. But there is a slight problem, because we have k by n matrices. So, a minor. so we need to take a minor. OK. So let's try it. Let's try to build a, ma build a map. So how many minors we have? How many maximal minors? It needs to be a maximal minor, because otherwise it would change. So how many maximal minors of a K by N matrix do we have? Yes? Yeah, one for each choice of N uh, of K columns, so N over K. N choose K. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so we haven't really defined this map, but we defined this map. It takes a full rank matrix and computes all of its maximal minors. Yes, is, it, is this definition clear? Um, so, so it's not really because I mean, the projective space is somehow, so, so it's, it's uh, the connection of all lines. Is that right? Yes. The, so, so if, we, if we treat this as a geometric object, this is a collection of all lines in this space n choose k. But we have also an algebraic description, which we, we can regard points here just as points if in this vector space up to scalar, up to multiplication by scalar. So a point here is typically denoted by a1 
up to a n choose k. Yes, but it doesn't make sense to ask what is A1. It's only a collection that makes sense because they are up to scalar. So for example, the quotient is well defined, but every single one is not defined. And the map we built takes a full rank matrix and puts A1 equal to the first minor. Why, why is it so important to go to the projective space? Note that for example, if we multiply F1 by 10, we didn't change the space, yes? We didn't, we changed the matrix, but we didn't change the space. We almost didn't change the basis, we just rescaled one of the vectors. But the effect on all maximal minors will be that they got multiplied by 10. Every single minor got multiplied by 10. So what I'm saying is that we cannot go to this affine space, but we can go to this projective space. And this projective space will not see the multiplication by A, precisely because a minor will just change by the determinant of A. Yes, you know that if you have square matrices, then the determinant of the product is the product of determinants. Yes, so here we have small determinants and every single one will get multiplied by the determinant of A. In particular, we will get exactly the same point in the projective space. So the conclusion of this discussion is as follows. There exists a map let's call it I going from the set of all subspaces I will just write briefly to P K and choose K. Given by taking all maximal minors. Some people are nodding, some people are confused, so maybe let me, let me be slightly more precise. That is, that is, we fix a basis of W and take MW and associate to it all minors, all K minors. Okay. But as we said, MW is not well defined given a subspace W. In particular, we can also have A times MW, but then we get the same minors every single one times the determinant of A. In particular, we get the same point in the projective space. You can do it on a small example that a row operation or any multiplication of rows changes the minors by multiplying them by the same constant coming from the determinant of the matrix of the change of basis on W. Yes, a change of basis is multiplication by, by by an invertible matrix and the determinant changes by the determinant of that matrix. That's linear algebra. Very good. So at least we managed to associate points in a projective space to subspaces of V, of dimension K. What could be our next aim? Our next aim could be to prove that this map is injective. Do you agree? If we want to construct a variety that will parameterize this, first we need a set that will parameterize, a subset of a projective space that will parameterize this, and our candidate will be the image of this map. But for this to make sense, this map needs to be injective.
and we will prove it. Okay, so let's assume that I of W1 equals I of W2. Okay, so what does it mean? Well, it means that we can fix a basis of W1, fix a basis of W2, and get the matrices MW1, MW2 have have the same, same maximal minors up to up to non-zero scalar. Is it clear? Any questions? Yes, a question. Very one question. What about, what about permutations of the of the basis vectors? That's a very good question. So what what does a permutation do? So for example, there are even an odd permutation. So what happens if we just permute two two rows? Clearly, we get the same space. Permuting the basis doesn't change the space. What does it do to minors? Absolutely, it is also invariant because it's, it's also invariant. It multiplies them by the determinant of the matrix corresponding to the odd permutation, which happens to be minus one, which gives the same point in the projective space. So this is a very special case of change of coordinates, exchanging two rows. That's, that's a good point. These matrices, in particular this action, uh, this action, where, where did I write the action? Oh, they're on the top. In particular, it makes them to be regarded only up to row permutations, okay? But that's a, a good question. Okay. Okay. So remember that these are full rank matrices. So it means that there exists a minor that is non zero. So without loss of generality, let's say that the first minor is non zero. Is it clear what I mean by first? I mean the, the one coming from columns one up to k. Okay, so if the first minor here is non-zero, we also know that the first minor here is non-zero because they differ by multiplication by a non-zero scalar. Now, let's bring those matrices to a better form using the change of basis. Now, if we have a minor, if we have a matrix, a K by K matrix with non-zero determinant, we can perform Gaussian elimination on it. Yes? And we can bring it down to diagonal form. Yes? We just pick in the first column a non-zero entry and we kill all the other entries in this row by subtracting that given row. Then we do it for a second and so on. Further, we may rescale every row. So the conclusion is that we can represent, we can represent W1 respectively W2 by following matrices MW1 tilde. And what happens here? It's a K by N matrix. But from what I said, we can assume that here we have identity. And here we have something. Yes, I just performed row operations. It's really easy that if you have an invertible matrix doing row operations and rescaling, you can bring it to such a form. And this 
this is nothing. It's just like to separate identity from, from the matrix for, for the notation. Any questions here? Okay. So what does it mean? Well, it means that if we look at these matrices, the maximal minors haven't changed up to globally multiplying by non-zero scalar. So in, in particular, this matrix and this matrix, they have the same minors up to multiplying by a non-zero scalar. But it happens that the first minor is equal to 1. The determinant of the first matrix is equal to 1. So this scalar has to be 1. Yes? So the conclusion. MW1 and, and MW2 have, have the same maximal minors. Okay? Because they have maxima, the same maximal minors up to scalar, but one of them is the same. So the scalar is 1. Okay, so anyone can tell me what is a maximal minor of MW1 in terms of matrix AW1? Can we somehow say what it is? Let's make an example. So for example, there is an entry here, here, here. What would be the maximal minor like this? in terms of AW1. What's the determinant of this matrix? So I, I don't take the first column, but I take the first column of AW1. What is the determinant of this matrix? Up to sign. Well, it's just the first entry of the column. Yes, that's this, just this entry. Exactly. Because, I mean, here we need to pick ones using Laplace expansion, and here we need to pick that entry. Okay, and what happens if I take some other minor? If I take, for example, these and some other two columns. Yes, so now I don't take the first two columns, but I take some other two columns. What will I get? Yeah, that would be a two by two minor of... Very good. It's this determinant of these things up to sign. Yes? Because here I need to take the ones, and here I just get the determinant. That's, again, basic fact from linear algebra when we expand the determinant with respect to these columns. So again, a conclusion is that maximal minors of M W1 tilde and MW1, W2 is the same as all, all minors of AW1. Yes? Any submatrix here, any square submatrix here, can be completed from this identity so that the determinant of the submatrix equals up to sign the determinant of the k minor of mw1 yes okay and now the lemma is obvious why because very particular minors are entries just like the first example this was a one by one minor yes so, in other words, we know that these matrices have the same maximal minors, but maximal minors are all minors of AW1 and AW2. So from these two facts, we see that all minors of AW1 and AW2 are equal. So all entries of AW1 and AW2 are equal. So AW1 is equal to AW2. Okay, but this means that the spaces are the same. We reconstructed the bases. Yes, so that finishes the proof of the lemma.
Very good. So what did we get? We get some subset of a projective space which points correspond to k-dimensional subspaces. So far, we don't know anything about this subset, but this will be our definition of a Grassmannian. This is the image of, of I. And whatever it is, the points correspond to subspaces, k-dimensional subspaces of W. Ah, one more. So this is the Grassmannian. And it comes with an inclusion in a projective space. And this inclusion is known as the Plucker embedding. Okay, so we have a lemma, now we need a theorem that the Grassmannian, well, we want to prove that this is a variety. So we want to prove that this is Zariski closed and irreducible. And we will prove it. Oh, oh, yes, yes. <laughs> and choose K. Thank you. Yes? Okay. So, first we focus on Zariski closed. What does it mean? Well, it means that we need to characterize the image of I by vanishing of some polynomials. In other words, we need to find polynomials that vanish on a point even only if it belongs to the image of I. That's the definition of algebraic variety, okay? That's the definition of Zariski closed. And in principle, we should look at homogeneous polynomials in the projective space. But we will proceed a little differently. Namely, if you remember from lecture two, there are these subsets, SI, of the projective space. I will come back to M. Uh, so M is, for us, will be uh, this dimension of V choose K. And they are isomorphic to Km minus one, yes? You remember, the projective space is covered by affine spaces. And what is this affine space? This is the set of points that have i-th coordinate non-zero. Yes, so we, given a point in a projective space, we cannot ask for the i-th coordinate, but we can check if it is non-zero, because it's only determined up to scalar. Yes, and if the i coordinate is non-zero, we can assume that it's equal to one, and then the other coordinates, there are m minus one of them, identify a point in a projective space. Okay, so we want to prove that the Grassmannian is closed in this space, but we have a covering of this space but by open sets. So we, we will prove that the Grassmannian intersected with SI is closed in SI. And of course, without loss of generality, we can assume that I is equal to one. Okay, let's do it.
So what is GKW intersected with S1? Well, it's a subset of a projective space. So this is an M tuple of numbers. What does it mean to be a Grassmannian? By definition, it means to be the, in the image of I, and I takes maximal minors. So a point belongs here, P1 up to Pm belongs here, even only if the following condition holds. Well, first of all, P1 is non-zero. This is because we are in S1. And second, what does it mean to be in a Grassmannian? Well, it means that it's in the image of I, so it means that there exists a K by N matrix such that PIs are the maximal minors of this matrix. Yes, there exists some MW such that P1 up to Pn, let's, let's, let's write it as a point in the projective space, is I of MW. That's by definition to be in the Grassmannian. And this is the same as this is equivalent. This is equivalent to the fact that PIs are, are maximal minors of MW. Yes? Uh, uh, could you maybe explain once more what, what SI is? Because I understood that SI is the, the uh, subspace where P1, P1 equals zero and not... No, it's when it's non-zero. It's an open set, it's not a closed set. But then why is it isomorphic to K M minus one? Because, because if it's non-zero in a projective space, we can scale it to be equal to one. And this gives a unique scaling and determines the other coordinates. Okay. Okay. So now a question for you, because you already seen this trick. What can we say about MW under this assumption that P1 is non-zero, or equivalently that P1 is equal to one? How can we represent in a clever way MW. Yes, again, we know that the first minor is non-zero, and by the same trick, we can represent it by such a matrix. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in fact, I erased too much because we want to characterize this condition that the point belongs here by some set of polynomials. So, so far we only make restatements. Well, we say that P1 is equal to one and the other points are maximal minors. Well, now we can make, we can make this equivalent. So I, I continue the, the lower point two. Uh, that, so continuation of two, that PIs are all minors of A. Yes? So we want to encode the condition that the sequence of numbers corresponds to all minors of some k times n minus k matrix. Can you do that? So we want to encode this condition by, by polynomials. So first we need to find polynomials that minors satisfy. Is it easy or hard? Yes? So for example, you have all the entries of A, Yes. And the minors are po o uh, the other minors are polynomial in the entries. So I guess these are equations that you have. This is a very good answer. It's not the one that we will choose, but it's a very good one. We have PIs that just correspond to entries of A, and every other minor is a polynomial in these entries, which gives us a polynomial that will vanish 
on the image of i, and in fact, it will describe it. Because the entries, they can be arbitrary, and as long as the other entries satisfy the equations coming from the fact that this is a minor, we are done. So that would finish the proof. But uh, we don't go this way because I would like lower degree equations. So I would like to find degree two equations that characterize this point, that we get a sequence of, of minors. So can anyone get, so notice that PIs, they come, they, they have a grading coming from the size of the matrix of A. So there are PIs that correspond to entries, there are PIs that correspond to two by two minors, three by three minors, and so on. And of course there are no equations among the PIs that correspond just to the entries. They can be chosen arbitrary because the matrix A is arbitrary. But once we fix the entries of A, everything else is well defined. So we somehow need equations that will characterize those bigger minors, yes? So we need some kind of an equation that, for example, a two by two minor, P, let's say that PQ is the determinant of some two by two submatrix, B. Well, then there is a natural quadric corresponding to the entries of B, yes? So this is B11 times B22 minus B12 times B21. And every single entry is some other PI. Okay, so this has to be some PI1, this has to be some PI2, this has to be some PI3, and this is PI4. Yeah? So this gives us a quadric when this is two by two. So, so, so far we are done with one by one, and two by two with quadrics. What with three by three? Can you, what, what would happen if PQ would be determinant of, let's say, B prime, where B prime is now three by three? Can you find a quadric that characterizes it? Uh, using Laplace. Uh, using Laplace expansions and the fact that we already characterized two by two minors. Yes, so we can say that this is this times this two by two minor, minus this and so on. Yes, so we can write this as a quadric in smaller minors and so on, okay? So this gives us the conclusion, conclusion at the top. As a set, GKW is defined by quadrics coming from Laplace expansion. Okay, so this shows that it's a closed set. Why is it irreducible? Anyone? So in general, it's hard to prove that things are irreducible unless we have a parameterization. Do we have a parameterization here? Well, yes. Maybe it's not the map I because it goes just from a set of subspaces, but we have this map that takes a full rank matrix and takes all minors of this matrix, yes? Now, you may worry that the full rank matrix is something strange, but just take all K by N matrices and take all of the min their minors. What we get is a parametrization of the affine cone over the Grassmannian. Yes, so it could happen that all minors are zero, but that's just a zero point in the affine space. And now, if we have a parametrization by something irreducible, it, the image needs to be irreducible. That's a very easy topological fact, because the pre-images of the components would give you the decomposition of the domain. Huh? So irreducible by the map. We take all K by N matrices 
and we go to now the affine space and choose k. And we take a k by n matrix and take all its minors. All minors. All k minors. The image is the affine cone over the Grassmannian, which is irreducible. A question? Yes. Uh, why don't we also get subspaces of lower dimension if we do this? Like corresponding so to if, matrix of lower rank? If, if the matrix would be of lower rank, if we take k minors, they will all vanish. Right. We will just get the zero, the vertex. That's a good question. Yes? OK. And now it's a quite easy exercise that an affine cone is irreducible even only if the projective variety is irreducible. OK. Uh, now I want to tell you one more thing, and there is still some place on the board before the break. So there will be a break, don't worry. <laughs> uh, or actually a few more things. So one is I have defined those quadrics in this set SI. And I used topology. I told you that the set is closed if it is closed in an affine covering. But if you are seeing this for the first time, maybe you would like to see homogeneous equations that cut out the determinant. So let's do it on an explicit example. And if you understand the example, you will, you will understand uh, the construction in general. So again, we have found degree two equations that cut out the Grassmannian on each SI. But from topology, it should follow that we should find homogeneous quadrics that vanish on a point, even only if it belongs to a Grassmannian. And I have not really talked about homogenization of polynomials, so I think it's a, it's a good example. So now we pass to Grassmannians. G2n, but this is not so, so important. The important thing is that we look at an example of G24. So what is G24? Let's write it explicitly. It's the image of the map that takes a two by four matrix and takes all of its minors. If I make a mistake, please let me know. How many numbers will, will I get? Six. Yes. Because that's a point in P5. Yes? And the image of this map is the Grassmannian G24. Now, if I look and then S1, which is an A5. I look at the image of matrices 1, 1, 0, 0, C, D, G, H. And what do I get? Uh, well, you can substitute. It will start with 1, because this determinant is 1. Then I will get entries. Of, uh, of this matrix, and at the end, I will get uh, the last entry will be just the two by two determinant. C H minus D G. Now, sorry, now I should write that, that this is a point in A5. Okay, now, what is the quadric here, first not homogenized quadric, that will vanish on those points? I will write you the coordinates if this helps you.
Okay. Yeah, so let's let's call those. This is like let's call it P11, P1, uh, sorry, P12, P13, P14, uh, P23, P24, P34. So remember, the coordinates, they correspond to two element subsets of four, and I just label them by the subset. What's the quadric? A quadric that vanishes on the image. That's very easy. So someone who hasn't seen Grassmannians before, can, can you find an equation? Yes, so okay, so maybe a first question, I put six numbers. But I wrote that this is in K5, so I'm, I'm interested in, in those five numbers, and I want to find an equation among them. There will be a unique quadric vanishing on the image. So someone who hasn't seen Grassmannians before. I need a degree two inhomogeneous polynomial equation in those variables that will vanish no matter what G, H, C, and D are. It's, it's just as in the proof. You have to expand the two by two determinant, which, which is basically done for you on the board. And you could since say g equals zero, h equals zero? No, no so, so we want an equation that vanishes no matter what g and h is. I want an equation in those parameter, in piece, no. such that if I substitute, I will always get zero. Minus c times h? Uh, Minus C, so that means P23. Okay. Times P14. Times P14. Uh, plus P34. Plus P34. Um, plus P24. Plus P24. Times P13. Times P13. I think that the signs shouldn't be correct, but let's check. P23 times P14, that's with a minus. Ah, then the minus. Yeah, so, so where is no, the minus? The last one I should have a minus. Okay, so that's the equation, but maybe that's a complicated way to see it. The easy way to see it is to say that the last one, P34, is what? It's C times H. C is minus P23 times H, P14, minus D times G. What's D? It's minus P24. What's G? It's P13. Yes? Okay. Okay, so this is an inhomogeneous quadric that defines a Grassmannian on S1. How to make it a homogeneous quadric that will vanish on the Grassmannian? Well, the trick is that we have this one, and we can always multiply by one. And if we have an equation that will vanish on an open set of the variety, it will vanish on the whole variety. So the trick is to take the lower degree part, which is this P34, and multiply it by one. But one is P12. So the full equation is P23 times P14 plus P12 times P34 minus P24 times P13. Yeah? That's the equation defining the image of this map. If you don't trust topology, you can substitute those minors for the piece and you will get zero. Okay, now can we say something about the Grassmannian before the break? So let me, let me give one more definition of a Grassmannian for people who know a little bit of groups and, and exterior algebra. And then we will also discuss the basic property of Grassmannian that is its dimension. And then we will make a break. Okay, so 
What is a more invariant? So all this was very coordinate based. I fixed a basis of a vector space. I choose a basis of a vector subspace. I represented it as a matrix. Maybe there is a more invariant way to, uh, to determine a point as a, as a Grassmannian, uh, uh, to determine Grassmannian as a variety. Okay, so we have this W in V. Let's still choose a basis, W1 up to WK, basis of W. But let's associate to it a vector in the exterior algebra, or more precisely, in the projectivization. So for those for of you who know from linear algebra the exterior algebra, there is a vector W1 wedge 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 WK in the projective space. And okay, so what is this? If you, if you don't know exterior algebra, let me just briefly say that elements here are sums of such things. And you can operate on such things by if you exchange two vectors here, you change the sign. And if you have A plus B wedge C, this is the same as H wedge C plus B wedge C. And this is the same as minus C wedge A plus B wedge C. Yes, I should also say that lambda A wedge C is the same as lambda A wedge C. So that's a small comment on exterior algebra. Uh, but the thing is that the Grassmannian can be identified with those vectors in the ex exterior power that are precisely of this form. So let me just write it as a fact. G, K, W is a subspace. So if you count the dimension, it will also be N choose K. Is a, is, is, well, let's say these are those points in P wedge k w such that there exists w1 up to wk linearly independent and x is equal to v1 wedge 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 vk. Okay, if you don't know exterior power, try to read about it in two lectures because we will be needing it soon more. So far, for this lecture, you can use an explicit construction of, of the Grassmannian. Uh, now, a remark is that we have a group action. Namely, the general linear group V acts on the space V. If we have a matrix and a vector, we can multiply a matrix by a vector and get a vector, yes? But this action also acts on subspaces. If we have a two-dimensional subspace in a three-dimensional space, if we make a linear transformation, we get a two-dimensional subspace. Yeah? So what we really get is that the GL acts on everything. It acts on the projectivization of wedge KV, and it also acts on the Grassmannian in this space. So if you want to know it precisely, if you take a matrix, in GL V, and if you take a point here, so let's take a point on the Grassmannian. So if you take a class W1 which WK in the Grassmannian, let's call this point W, then AW by definition is just the point of AW1 which 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 AWK. Where here, I just mean the usual multiplication of a matrix by a vector. Okay, and the conclusion, oh, there is no space for conclusion. <laughs> let's erase something. Uh, this, let's, let's keep this example because I will want you to, to do something for homework if you are seeing this for the first time on this example. This group not only acts on this Grassmannian, but notice that if we pick two points of the Grassmannian, 
then we can always find a matrix that will send W1 to W1 prime, WK to WK prime. So the conclusion is, that the Grassmannian is an orbit of GLV, yes? We pick a point, we act on it, and we get all other points of the Grassmannian. In other words, if we have a K subspace, we can find a linear transformation that will put it in some other, in any other K subspace. And even more, it is an orbit, it is a unique closed orbit. And such things are called homogeneous varieties. This is a very strong property, that it is an orbit under a group action. Yes, that we can get any other point by fixing one point on a Grassmannian and acting with, with a group. Uh, now, if you are seeing exterior algebra for the first time, try looking at the notes to write this map using exterior algebra and try to see why this minor appears as the coordinate in the exterior algebra if you fix a basis. That's an exercise for you. And if you have troubles, you can always come to my office and we can do it together. Now, something easy, just before the break. What is the dimension of GKV, of the Grassmannian? Well, it's a variety, so one of its most important numbers associated to it is the dimension. And we would like to know this number. Let's, let's write n. And this you already know from our discussion here. Namely, the dimension of a Grassmannian is the same if we intersect it with any SI, because SRI are open, they are Zariski dense. So to understand this number, we need to understand the intersection of a Grassmannian with, let's say, S1. What is this? We, we discussed it uh, a lot of times, already at least twice during this lecture. What happens when I intersect Grassmannian with S1? Well, it's an image of some K of some matrix that is of the form K times N minus K. And I take all minors, yes? This is obtained by taking all minors. Mm -hmm. What can we say about this map? Is it, it goes to G, K, W intersected S1. Well, in fact, it's a bijection on this set, yes? What we said before is that any point on the Grassmannian with non-zero, with first minor equal to one, is really coming from all minors of such a matrix, yeah? So this is really an affine space of this dimension, yes? Because this belongs to K, k times n minus k. So our Grassmannian doesn't really differ from affine spaces apart from the fact that these affine spaces are glued together to form something compact. Just as the projective space, yes? So the projective space was also obtained in this way. We're gluing together affine spaces. And so is the Grassmannian. Huh? Okay, so let's see if you understood it. So what's the dimension? of GKN.
What's the dimension? Yes? It's just the k times n minus k times n minus k. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So we had a first crash course on exterior powers of vector spaces, and now we all know homogeneous varieties and the group action on such exterior powers. There will be also a lecture on representation theory, so it's good that we had during the break this short crash course. Uh, let's come back to this example. Uh, what have we done here? What's the dimension of the Grassmannian G24? I erased the formula, but maybe you remember. Yeah? The dimension again? So the dimension of the Grassmannian G24. Yes? It should be also 6, because mm -hmm. four, 4, if you have mm, n over n minus k. Okay. It's in the space that has 6 coordinates, so it's in P5, it, so it's at most 5. It's 4. It's 4. And we even found the equation. So this is the unique equation. of the Grassmannian G24. I will not prove it in full generality, but I should say that, in fact, the ideal of the Grassmannian, of any Grassmannian, the ideal of any Grassmannian is generated by quadrics. by degree two polynomials. So what we have proved is that there exist degree two polynomials that vanish if and only if the point belongs to the Grassmannian, but this is a stronger statement that the whole ideal is generated by quadrics. Okay, and here we have an example of it. We have a homogeneous quadric. So the Grassmannian G24 is really a four-dimensional quadric in P5, okay? now. We want to understand special sub-varieties of the Grassmannian, so-called so Schubert varieties. And this is very important for enumerative uh, algebraic geometry. If you want to count something, we will, we will make examples of, of this. How do we define Schubert varieties? First, let's fix a flag in V. So what's a flag? It's a sequence of subspaces and the full flag, uh, sequence of subspaces contained in each other, and the full flag, a complete flag, means that the dimension grows one by one. So we fix a point. We fix a point inside a line, inside a two space, inside a three space, Inside the four space, sorry. Yes. Mm. Ah, okay, one, one, one comment. So we will be dealing with V, it's four dimensional. So this is k to the four. Uh, but that's a remark. We said that the Grassmannian GKV parameterizes k dimensional linear subspaces of V. But equivalently, it parameterizes K minus one dimensional projective subspaces in the projectivization of V. Why? Because each time if we have a K subspace, we can just projectivize it and we get a pk minus one in the projectivization. And the other way around, if we have a pk minus one, we just look at its affine cone, or in other words, all representatives of vectors that belong here. Okay, so G24, G24, as an example of this, G24, it parameterizes lines, P1s. in P3. Yes? P1s in the projectivization of four-dimensional space. So this is something we can really think about. We can think about lines 
in a three space, arbitrary lines in a three space. And that's a thing that, that um, Grassmannian parameterizes, maybe a historical remark. So the name Grassmannian comes from Grassmann, who was a mathematician, and the name Plucker embedding comes from Plucker, and what was their contribution? So it's not that the Grassmannians were invented by Grassmann. What Grassmann really first observed, that was, I think, the first half of the 19th century, is that if you use language of algebra, you can do geometry in dimension higher than three. That's his observation. Clearly, it's very, very important for Grassmannians where, where you want to encode a high dimensional object. So what, what, what did Plucker do? That's, I think, already the second half of the 19th century. He exactly realized this G24. So he was studying lines in the three space. And he realized that lines in the three space, they can be considered as points on a quadric. So he somehow realized that the Grassmannian G24 makes sense as an object that parameterizes lines in a three space. And you can find the article of Plucker still online and, and read it. Okay, so we are really studying lines in a three space. So what do we do? We fix a point, a line, a plane in a three space. That's a complete flag. So this is, this, is, this is a P1, this is a P2, this is a point, uh, well, and this is a P3. We fix a flag. Now, how will we distinguish subsets of a Grassmannian? Well, a point in a Grassmannian is a line, and we can see how it intersects this flag. Okay, so we want to stratify the Grassmannian G24 or we want to find some sub-varieties of it. So can you define, using this flag, a special point in the Grassmannian G24? Is there a distinguished point? So remember, G24 parameterizes P1s in P3. Is there a distinguished P1? Yes. yes. <laughs> so let's call it X0. That's a point, a zero dimensional point, which just con consists of the line F1. Okay? Okay. Now we want to build higher dimensional sub varieties, not only points in the Grassmannian. And we start with, we start with one dimensional sub varieties. So can you find a one dimensional subspace of lines that does something special with respect to this flag. Maybe contains something, maybe is contained somewhere. So we want to say that these are lines in P3 such that, and now we want to write a condition with respect to that flag. And we want it to be one dimensional. Yeah, so we have a point, a line going through it, a plane containing that line, and we want to find a one-dimensional family of lines. Yeah. We, we fix the point, a line, a plane. How do I build from this a one-dimensional family of lines? Yes? Uh, choosing different points of the plane and drawing back through these uh, and through the other point. Yes, that's a, that's, a, that's, a good, that's a very good, so, so that's a very good idea. So I choose some other point in a plane, and then it uniquely characterizes a line. So it looks like I got a two-dimensional family because I can choose it in, on, on, a, on a plane. But of course, I mean, these points, they give me the same line. Yeah, so this is a one-dimensional family. So what did we really construct? We constructed lines that contain this point and are contained in the plane. Yes? That's a one-dimensional family. Okay. Can you give me a three-dimensional family? Uh, 
I want now a three-dimensional family of lines that I can characterize by this flag. Okay, now I allow you a little more than just containment in or containing. I also allow you to use the word intersection. Can you give me a three-dimensional family of lines? Anyone? Okay, okay, so all lines containing the point. All lines containing a point. Uh, so, uh, so, 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 how many are there such lines? Let's think. Ah, uh, no, it's two dimensional, right? Yeah, but but that's a very good idea. So. What, what happens, how to characterize a line going through a point? Well, we have to choose another point in a P3, yeah, and this uniquely characterizes a line, but then every line is counted one dimensional many times, because any point on that line will give the same line. So it's not true that every point in P3 gives a different line. So this would be a two-dimensional family. Okay, how about the three-dimensional family? So we want something bigger. Well, now you take all lines that intersect this line. All lines that intersect a line. Because now you vary the point that you chose on, on, on a one-dimensional space, so it adds one to the dimension. Yes, yes. Okay, and it looks like we are done. We constructed varieties of all dimension, but there is something missing. Maybe you can give me another variety that is also two-dimensional. So all lines going through a point. Yes? Maybe all lines going through one particular point? That, that, that's all lines going through a particular point. That's this one. On the plane. Yeah, well, F F zero is on the plane. Yes, but do you still, um, if if you if you could move outside of the plane, the uh, subspace would become two dimensional. If we could move outside of the plane. Yes, in the three D space, for example. Yes, yes, this is this is this is two dimensional. I agree. That's why I put a two here. All lines going through a point arbitrary in a three space. Anything else? Contained in F two. Contained in F2, that's very good. That's also two-dimensional. Okay. G23. Yes. By your formula is two. Yes, that's one way to, to compute it. Uh, we will have a, a, a very good understanding of those in, in let's say, 10 minutes. Uh, okay. So. In some exercises, you're asked to generalize it to arbitrary Grassmannians, and there is a combinatorial trick to do it, how to encode them, using so-called Young diagrams. You can read what are Young diagrams, and you can try to do, I think it's exercise one, to build a bi bijection between special Schubert varieties and uh, Young diagrams. Now, why are Schubert varieties so important? Because they encode what is known as the cohomology of the Grassmannian. And I will not define in like five minutes what's a cohomology ring, but I would like just you to get an intuition. So first of all, it's a ring. So you can multiply elements there. In particular, we have to be able to multiply this Schubert varieties, so we will do it in a second. And this multiplication should correspond to intersection. Uh, and uh, what is this cohomology ring based on? The basis, in some cases, like in the case of Grassmannian, it can be given by special sub-varieties. And the magical thing about the cohomology ring is that if you are given some other sub-variety, then you can deform it to a combination of those special sub-varieties. Okay, so our ring, it will be a ring built on these symbols. So this will be a cohomology class. Uh, 
And let's try to think how we intersect, uh, how we intersect them. Now, the problem is that if you intersect classes, if you know a little bit of cohomology, it's not always true that you can intersect the particular realizations of those classes. You have to move your varieties a little so that the intersection becomes transversal. Uh, and what, what do I mean by it? Let's try to intersect x1, sorry, x2 with x2. Well, if you just intersect x2 with x2, it doesn't make sense because it would just give you x2. But note that if we change the flag, we get different representatives. So this x2, its definition depends on the flag. But I tell you that the class does not. So in other words, here we take all lines through one point, And here we take all lines through another point. What do we get? So line two. Two points. Yes? So it's a one point. So this is a class of x0, so a class of a point. Which happens to be a class of x0. OK. Now, what happens if we intersect x2 times prime times x2 prime? So now I take all lines in one plane and all lines in another plane. So x1 would be, sorry, so we move everything. We move, we move one plane, and we get another plane, another point, and another line. So they should intersect in a line. They intersect in a line, and the on, it's the only line that is contained in both. So it's also a class of a point. Now, a slightly trickier part is to deduce what's the intersection of x3 with x3. And here I will cheat a little because I will make such a picture. I will assume that the two lines intersect. And now we want to find the lines that intersect this line and this line. They come in two flavors. Either they belong to the plane, and everything that belongs to the plane will intersect the both, both lines. Or they go through this point. And everything that goes through this point also intersects both lines. OK. And now we are ready. Uh, ah, one more, one more. Namely, what's the intersection of x2 and x2 prime? So now we take all lines through one point, and all lines contained in some different plane. What's the intersection? Now I take a point all lines through that point, and I take a plane, all lines through that plane. Yeah, you know the answer, I see. Yeah, it's zero, it's nothing. There are no lines going through a fixed point and contained in some distinct plane. Very good. Okay, so we did the hard working and now comes something nice. Uh, can I ask maybe, if you want, why can you assume that the two lines meet? Yes, so I mean, this is cheating a little, but really what you want is that the intersection to be transversal, so the dimensions are correct. But to be honest, you would have to check if there are no like multiplicities. So each time I write, it's a point. So for example, of course, when two, two, two planes intersect, how do I know they intersect in one line and it's not like a double line? So all this would need to be formalized. But again, OK, one can prove a very general combinatorial way to intersect these varieties. But here you can say that, I mean, the intuition is as follows. The dimension is correct. So usually you have to move the flag in order for the intersection to be of correct dimension. And once it is of correct dimension, the only thing you have to worry about is the multiplicity. 
And now you can ask me why the multiplicities are one, but I hope it's like at least intuitive that you don't get double lines or, or anything. Okay, so let's solve a problem. Let's solve a problem. Problem. Fix four lines, L1 up to L4, for general lines in P3. How many lines intersect all, the, all, of, them, all of those lines? Maybe you can answer this question using geometry, but once we know Schubert calculus, it's really simple. In other words, we want to describe a set in a Grassmannian that intersects all of the four general lines. Yeah, so I pick one, two, three, four, and I look for lines that intersect all of them. Okay, so what's the locus that intersects L1? Well, the locus that intersects L1 this is our x3. Yes? What's the locus that intersects L2? That's x3. What's the locus that intersects L3? What's the locus that intersects L4? Yeah? So we need to compute this class. Let's do it. This is just a commutative ring. We know that x3 times x3 is x2 prime plus x2. Oh, what did I write? And we need to square this. Yes, from what we described above. Now, this is a usual ring. This is x2 prime squared plus 2 x2 x2 prime plus x2 prime squared. What do we get? Two points. One point from here, one point from here, zero from here. And that's the end. There are two lines that intersect four general lines in P3. Okay? And what you can find in the notes are more complicated examples and in the exercises uh, of, 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 of such computation. Uh, we want to get back to Gorasmanian's G2N. So, so far we really well understood G24. And uh, let's, let's think about G2N. Any questions? So, so is that understandable for, of course, I mean, in the script it's written uh, for, for real familiar with algebraic topology. So if, if I'm not familiar with algebraic topology, is, I mean, because I What's the cohomology ring, you mean, or? No, I mean, what's, for example, yeah, what's this notation with the square brackets? I mean, it's uh, yes, so completely, uh, I mean, what's written there does not have the slightest meaning. Okay, okay, that's, that's. That's, that's understandable. <laughs> uh, so, but you will have to take a few things for granted. And one of them is that given, let's say, a smooth algebraic variety, you can associate to it a very nice ring. And elements of this ring, there are, well, combinations, but let's say basic some elements of this ring are classes of varieties. So each time you have sub-varieties of your variety. Each time you have a subvariety, you can take its class. Yeah, that's an element of, of this mysterious ring, chow ring. You can read about chow rings. So these are certain equivalence classes of subvarieties. Yes? So a subvariety gives you a class. Now, 
Addition in this ring is trivial. You just write one class plus another class plus a third class plus a fourth class. You don't do anything on that. But the multiplication is something very nice. Namely, multiplication corresponds to intersection of the varieties, assuming that the representatives lie in a good position. So for example, if you intersect a class of a line in P2 with a class of a line in P2, you shouldn't get a line. You should get a point. Because a line and a line, they, if they are in general position, they intersect in a point. They don't intersect in a line. That's a very special situation. OK, so now what I give you sort of for three is that the fact that the ring for a Grassmannian, it just has these symbols, x0, x1, x2, x2 prime, x3. In general, the only varieties you need are the varieties you get from a complete flag. You don't need other varieties to understand the Chow ring of the Grassmannian. OK, so this gives you, let's say, as a vector space, a basis. So if the ring would be just the vector space, this would be the basis of that vector space. This is what you have to trust. But now you can ask, what's the ring structure? You told me I, that I don't give you a vector space, that I give you a ring. Well, I tell you. The ring structure, the product, comes from intersection. So you should be able to deduce what's the intersection of any two things. Yeah? And I hope it was quite intuitive that if you take lines through one point and lines through another point, you get just one line. That's a class of a point. OK, so you get this table, and this defines you a structure of a ring on this vector space. And now there is another fact that you have to buy, is that this mysterious ring that you associate to Grassmannian is really this very easy vector space with this very easy multiplication. OK? But now you can get a lot from this. You can get a lot because now you can do arbitrary operations on this ring. Yeah? And, and you can still use the fact that it corresponds to intersection. So what does it mean that a line intersects all four lines? Well, it means that you have to take all lines that intersect L1, you have to take all lines that intersect L2, all lines that intersect L4. All these, if you take all lines that intersect L1, it is a sub-variety of the Grassmannian. Well, it's some sub-variety, but we know its class. We know its class because this is how X3 was defined. These were all lines that intersect a fixed line. Yes? So these are different sub-varieties, but, but as classes, they give the same class. So we want to intersect the variety of lines that intersect L1, the variety of lines that intersect L2, the variety of lines that intersect L4. And this could be hard, but at least we can get the class. That's easy. Because we know how to multiply the class four times. Yes, it's a ring. And I, well, I gave you, or you deduced, the multiplication table for that ring. So you know how to multiply x3 by x3. Well, it's written here. It's x2 prime plus x2. Yeah? So this is just x3 to the fourth, which happens to be x3 squared squared. Yes, so x3 squared is this. Now I square it. I use the usual multiplication. It's a commutative ring, nothing fancy. And what I get is a class of two points, which means that when I intersect my four varieties, well, what I get is two points. Yeah, and does that make sense? I mean, if you have four lines, then, then you have two. There, yes, so it's not an easy geometric observation. Where are these two lines? But this is a proof that if you do this, you get two lines. And mind you, somehow, if you have four lines, they won't intersect at all. I mean, in general. So, so where should they where should they intersect? Right. So then, is it a, maybe I have not got this classes principle? I mean, what's... so the four lines don't intersect, but there exist two lines that intersect all the four lines. Some two lines. It's not. So trivial to see them. I mean, you can do it. But not both of them 
Both of them. All of them, but uh, so one line intersects two of them. No, 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 no. no. One line intersects L1, L2, L3, and L4, and the second line also intersects L1, L2, L3, and L4. Oh, oh okay. Um, maybe, okay. Mm -hmm. It's true. <laughs> I'm not saying it's trivial. That's why this is why I wanted to tell you that it's a little bit useful to know this strange showering because it gives you some, some power. Okay, so, so we, we have to skip a few examples, but, uh, but, but you can read them in the notes, and there are also exercises to do more, 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 more things of this type. This is called Schubert Calculus, and it's a really, really major tool in, uh, in, in algebraic geometry, in like, uh, to compute the number of anything inside somewhere. You can very often translate this to a Schubert problem. And, and here, to, to read off this table, I was asking you, but there is a combinatorial trick to really get the multiplication of Schubert varieties, and it's very, very easy. Okay. So let's get back to Grassmannian's G2N. Well, there are a few ways. We can interpret it in which to see uh, Kn. Yeah. Okay, so recall that our space is indexed by two element subsets of n. Huh? So there is a very natural way to interpret this space. This is a space of skew symmetric n by n matrices. Yeah? A point here, well, if you, if you prefer it this way, so a coordinate here is given by an indexed pair, i smaller than j, uh, uh, smaller or equal to n. And this gives us the ijth entry of the matrix. Or if you know this notation, a point here, a point here in wedge to kn, it's really a sum of ei wedge ej and some pij. So ei wedge ej is a basis of this space. That's from the crash course. If, 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 if E1 up to En is a basis of, of W. OK. Our aim is to understand the points in the Grassmannian as skew symmetric n by n matrices. So of course, this is a proper subspace of this. So these are some special skew symmetric n by n matrices. What kind of matrices? Well, we should interpret this equation as a condition on four by four matrices. So this would be a condition on four by four matrices. Okay, so an exercise for you. If A is a four by four, skew symmetric, is it clear what I mean by a skew symmetric? It means that the ijth entry is minus the jith entry. 4 by 4 skew symmetric matrix. What's the determinant of A? Well, this is a degree 4 polynomial in the entries of the matrix. What is it? Do you know? That's a question from linear algebra. What's the determinant of a skew symmetric matrix? So a determinant of an even skew symmetric matrix happened to be a square of polynomial. 
So this is of degree four. So Q is of degree two. Yeah? And this is known as the Pfaffian. So I, I write it on a four by four example, but this is general for even, even sized skew symmetric matrices. But let's focus on this four by four example. Each time we have a skew symmetric, so if we have a large n by n skew symmetric matrix, each time if we find a four by four skew symmetric submatrix, the determinant of this submatrix will be a square of a quadric. And maybe now you can guess what's the quadric. It's the same quadric as the one above. Okay? So, in other words, we can interpret this equation, or more formally, a square of this equation, as the determinant of the skew symmetric matrix representing the point in the projective space. Okay. So can you repeat why are we interested in the four by four sub uh, Q symmetric matrices? Yes. So I okay, so let, let me make let me make a statement. So for for G24, there is no submatrix. We just look at the whole matrix, and I give it to you for three, you can check it, that this equation of the Grassmannian is the square root of the determinant. Okay, now to get equations in general of the Grassmannian, what do we have to do? How did we get equations of a Grassmannian? Do you remember? We needed to choose an SI, so we needed to choose two indices, let's call them IJ, which we usually assumed to be one, two. And we needed to choose a two by two minor, let's call it KL, and we expanded this two by two minor as this entry times this entry plus this entry times this entry. Yeah? So in order to specify an equation of the Grassmannian, we need to choose I, J, K, and L from one to N. So I, J, K, and L from one to n. So these four tuples of numbers, they give us quadrics vanishing on the Grassmannian, okay? And precisely the quadric, the computation is not different from G24. The corresponding quadric is PIL L times PJK minus PIK times PJL plus PIJ times PKL. Yeah? You can check that if you choose these four indices, well, if you fix these four indices, it's really the case of G24. So you really get one quadric. And this is this quadric. Okay. But now, if you have a skew symmetric matrix, how do you determine a four by four submatrix? Well, you need to fix I, J, K, L, I, J, K, L. And the claim from the two by four computation is that this is a square of the determinant. Uh, yeah, so this squared is the determinant of this submatrix. Let's call it A, I, J, K, L. Okay, so the conclusion is that as a set, the G24, the G2N Grassmannian is just given by the vanishing of those minors. And if we want to get an ideal, we need to take square roots of those four by four minors. And, and this last statement I will prove as a theorem. The n choose four quadrics. So these, these quadrics. Yes, for every 
choice of i, j, k, l, I get a quadric form a reduced Grubner basis, so it's even more than generators of the ideal of the Grassmannian. So to talk about the Grubner basis, I have to take you a monomial order. And this is for any monomial order. on Pijs such that this is the leading term Pil times Pjkl is the leading term okay so is the statement understandable? If you fix an order on the variables that for any quadric will say that this is the leading term, then these quadrics form a reduced Grubner basis of the ideal of the Grassmannian. This theorem is a little cheated because I haven't told you that such an order exists, but it does. So, yeah. Okay. Let's prove it, and this will be the last thing we 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 do today. Uh, what do we already know? We already know that these quadrics. So let's call J the ideal of quadrics. J, ideal generated by those quadrics, those entries for quadrics. Okay, and let's call this ideal I. So how is J related to I? Well, it's certainly contained there, because this quadrix vanish on the Grassmannian. But from the first hour of the lecture, we know a little more. And from Nullstellensatz, what's the relation? So J defines the Grassmannian as a set. So? Oh. Uh, <laughs> what's what's Nullstellensatz saying? They have the same radical. They have the same radical. That's, that's true for sure. Or I don't know how you write, maybe a square root. But this is the ideal of a Grassmannian. Ideal of the variety is? Already radical. It's already radical. It's an irreducible algebraic variety. It's even prime. Yes? OK, so we know that the radical of j is i. So what we really want to prove is that J itself is a radical ideal. Okay, so let's for a moment think forward. Assume you know this is a Grubner basis. Assume you know this is a Grubner basis of J. Assume that this is not only a set of generators, but this is a Grubner basis. Now, it's a very easy exercise. You can do it in five minutes after the lecture, but unfortunately I don't have time. If you Take an ideal, and if you take the initial monomials of the Grubner basis, this is an initial ideal, and if this is square free, meaning that there are no squares in the initial ideal or higher powers, meaning that the initial ideal is radical, then the ideal is radical. So let's write it. Assume, assume quadrics. form a GB of J. Then, initial ideal of J is radical. This is very easy because there are no powers here. 
And this implies, it's really a five minute exercise, that J is radical. Yes? And if J is radical, then we are done, because we know this is equal to J. Yeah? So this is what we want, that this is equal to J. So the only thing to prove is that the quadrix form a Grubner basis of J. Yes? And now uh, I was asked to refer you to Cox for Buchberger algorithm to compute, to compute Grubner basis. There is a test to compute S pairs of polynomials to test if something is a Grubner basis. So let's prove that this is a Grubner basis. And the proof can use computer. So for n equal 4, 5, 6, and 7, you can do it on a computer. You can check that this is, in fact, a Grubner basis. Now, what happens when n is equal to 8? So Buchberger algorithm to compute the Grubner basis or to check if something is a Grubner basis, it computes so-called S pairs. So what is an S pair? Read about it, but it's something that takes two polynomials and returns a polynomial. S comes from subtraction, so it's not really different than subtraction of the two polynomials. And the thing is that when n is equal to 8, there are two cases when we take two polynomials of this form. We have i, l, j, k, and we have i prime, we have i prime, j prime, k prime, l prime. Either these sets intersect, but then we are really in the case of seven, of n equals seven. Then the cardinality of union is seven, and we can make the reduction by the previous cases. Or these things are distinct. Yes, that's the only other possibility. But if they are distinct, then the leading terms of the two monomials are co-prime. And the part of the Buchberger algorithm tells you that you don't need to consider such espers. Thank you very much. That's the end. Thank you.